You're listening to Wisdom of the Ages, the show that taps into the many expressions of universal, ancestral, and personal wisdom to ignite evolutionary consciousness. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Wisdom of the Ages. This is a time and place where we discuss topics that weave the sacred into modern day reality. So one of the reasons I decided to create the Wisdom of the Ages podcast is because I saw quite clearly that the sacred feminine is not taken seriously, and that's at our peril. So it's a time for shifting consciousness, and it's happening. So our current dualistic split isn't found just in Judeo-Christianity. It's found in most of the world's religions, including Buddhism and Hinduism. So I enjoyed, in, in my quests, finding the fairy grail, which you can read about in my Legends of the Grail series. And the fairy grail gave me some hope that we might just find our way back to a non-dual, non-hierarchical approach to spirituality. But if you really want to experience the in-breath and the out-breath of creation, I have the guy for you. (laughs) So Mark Whitwell, with his new provocative book, God and Sex, now we get both, is here with us today. And I'm so excited to have him on the show because he dares to ask why the concept of God can inspire violence. And he explains that sex is an invitation into life. He writes that sex is the substance of reality itself, the attraction of equal opposites that create life. So we're gonna discuss this book on the show. So Mark is the founder of the Heart of Yoga Foundation, a nonprofit committed to yoga education around the world. Mark has taught yoga for many decades throughout the US, Europe, Asia, and Oceania, adapting the principles of the great tradition to the needs of the people from many cultures and countries. So here we are. We're going to talk about God and sex. Hello, Mark Whitwell. Thank you so much, Anne, for that beautiful introduction. It's a very great privilege to be talking to you and talking to all those people out there, all those lovely people. And thanks, everybody, for giving me the privilege of talking to you for a moment. I just, so I just uh, love you, Mark, and I've watched you over the years and um, just feel like you're a dear, dear friend, not only to me, but to all, for all of humanity. You know, thank goodness that you're here on the planet. Thank so you I have so a, much. I have a question for you. Why did you put God and Sex together as a title? My observation in my life is that this cultural assumption that's universal all around the world, that God and sex are two different phenomena, uh, has actually made both vulgar and useless, worse than useless, even destructive. Um, to the human life, this automatic assumption that God and sex are two different things. Because of course, <laughs> no, they're not. Of course they're not. That the union of male, female is the very method of, of God or the method of life. And, you know, if we, if the word God can be uh, a tricky word to use, <laughs> And uh, I use it cautiously, but, you know, I could replace the word God with reality or the power of the cosmos, you know, the source reality that is arising is everything. But I'm happy to use that word God because I see it as a a correction of of the right use of the word God. (laughs) So obviously... It is God's method to combine male and female in a perfect union, a perfect harmony, uh, a great power, uh, an extraordinary beauty (laughs) that is life, that is everything in the natural world, is the beauty of God, of reality itself. And I think everybody's noticed that. Mm. If you look at anything in in the natural world, it is you know, unspeakable beauty. Yes. And guess what? You know, everybody listening, you are of the natural world. You are the beauty. Mm-hmm. So 
this is how life is working, how God is working to join the two and the great spark of life is <laughs> suddenly appearing, God knows how, <laughs> there it is, you know, and, and new life comes. That's how that is the process. So God and sex are indeed one reality. It just um, seems it seems like it's it's humanity has suffered a lot over both of these these uh, both God you know God because of all the wars and so forth and also sexuality I, just the poor men I, I was reading in your book about the the men who had to to give up the love of the world the love of the feminine the the embrace yeah. of everything natural to to do what they think was good and and to enter into service and how. In a lot of ways, not only has it denied women uh, of, of something sacred, but it also has broken the hearts and bodies of a lot of men. Of course, and that is still the situation. You know, we, we, we are in a, you know, thanks for the internet and, and universal publishing and, you know, smartphones everywhere. We, we can be, well, we are in a dialogue uh, that perhaps, you know, even our parents... Uh, uh, didn't have the benefit of this dialogue, but now we're we're in the um, a, a keen investigation. Like, is this valid? <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, and even the model of the perfect person, you know, that is mm. so intrinsic <clears throat> to our uh, our own uh, thought structures of social mind, uh, is implying that everybody else is not perfect. Mm. You know, you have the perfect person and everybody is in some sort of uh, struggle trying to become perfect in the arbitrary methods given by the, this, this idea. So, mm. and let's be clear, civilization has been created uh, by that idea. It's been the power mechanism right. of uh, creating societies all around this world. And it's great, time. You talked about the great chain of being. You go into that quite deeply in the book, and it's it's sort of horrifying, actually. And you, you actually bring up that that enlightenment is actually a hoax, which which I found quite shocking. I say I call it a male fantasy. A male fantasy, fantasy. yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. The, the model of the perfect person is implying that everybody else is not perfect, and that is the the thought structures of our societies that we've, we've been born into. So we, we have those in us. So it is time to put God and sex together as uh, one statement. Now we get both is mm. the subtitle. And we, as any two sincere people talking to each other in same sex or opposite sex intimacy, mm. or um, I mean the public, Right. <laughs> we, the public, we right. get both. It's yeah. time to investigate this um, instrument of power that was imposed on yes. humanity with the invention of doctrine and uh, see clearly that, of course, each and every person is the beauty, is the power of the cosmos, mm. is the pure intelligence of life, mm. how life is functioning, and each body Everyone is in perfect harmony with the entire cosmos, with air, with light, with water, with the green realm, and in the male-female collaboration as equals and opposites, where one empowers the other in an endless mutual exchange, is the very uh, reality of every single person. And it is our birthright to uh, acknowledge that perfection that Mark, is the cosmos. If, if I wanted to, to work with you, what's your website? Heartofyoga.com. And I know that you have a course coming up uh, so we can actually <laughs> move and work with these, these, um, some of these concepts. So we're going to talk about that after we come back from yeah, a break. I want my, I mm -hmm. want my book and, and all of our conversations to be very practical and very useful to everybody mm -hmm. so that they can take some practical action. That's why we're putting a course out on January 1st. That's wonderful. And, and so what, just in a, in a 
30 seconds, what would you say would be the course is about? It helps every person, no matter who they are, do a yoga that is right for them, adapted to each individual and their unique needs. Their body type, their age, their health, and their cultural background is all respected. And each person can do a simple practice that is indeed the union of the male-female qualities of life that are in every beautiful person. That's That's incredible. That's what it's about. Let's talk about it some more. I just need to take a break and uh, and then we'll come back and, and talk about it in a few minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Hello, everyone. This is Tonya Don Reckla, Executive Director of Superpower Experts. And we want to thank each of you for making Superpower Up the number one podcast network for personal development and spiritual growth. Because people like you have the courage to say that mindfulness, healthy living, disrupting reality, the pursuit of consciousness, responsible entrepreneurship, and radical parenting matter. We now amass over 1 million downloads monthly in more than 90 countries. Our numbers keep growing because there are far more people willing to live divergently than mass media wants to acknowledge. For you, the change makers, the light bearers, the way showers, we say thank you. If you're ready to take the next step in your evolution, go now to superpowerexperts.com and take the superpower quiz. And as Neva Lee Rekla, our youngest podcaster, likes to remind us, remember, we all have superpowers and we can change the world. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Wisdom of the Ages podcast. You can find out more about this show on wisdomoftheages.superpowerexperts.com. And today we're talking with brilliant guest Mark Whitwell. (laughs) <laughs> and we're going into subjects hardly anybody wants to talk about. We all need to. God, sex, and oneness. So welcome back, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, and I'm enjoying our conversation. So I, I'd like to, to shift to something personal. I think people might enjoy this. I, I, mm. I met you years and years ago. Um, I, I married to John Patrick Sullivan. He's also been on, on the show. And John Patrick uh, has been your your student and friend, and has learned so much from you over the years. And of course, you're you're responsible really for us getting together. And and I wondered if you would share your version of that story. I remember meeting John Patrick, a wonderful young man, in a yoga studio where I was teaching a weekend course in Santa Barbara, California. And uh, we had a great time. He adapted to the practice very easily, quickly. He was loving it. And we became quite friendly in that initial meeting. And uh, I think uh, a day or two later, I visited him in his uh, new home. And it was a Vedanta ashram uh, where the guru was Ramana Maharishi. Mm. And uh, it was so interesting. I, I loved John Pat, I mean, he came, he had just ended a long, famous career of being, uh, you know, the greatest uh, footballer and uh, the greatest. um, He's a middle linebacker. Yeah, (laughs) and I remember he's in the the world record book or something, you know. Yeah, the the Hall of Fame. He's a Hall of Fame. He played with the Jets and the Bears, yeah. (laughs) The champion of champions. He beat the record of Dick... uh, Oh, somebody famous too. Yeah, anyway, Bacchus, yeah. mm-hmm. so I was like deeply impressed with this uh, beautiful man, and uh, he he was making use of yoga, and living in the ashram, and it was being being very hard for him to transition from being a uh, a U.S. famous celebrity uh, with an injured body. <laughs> he said he was, mm-hmm. he was like dumped off the truck like a meat package, <laughs> you know. After he was, <laughs> Sure. finished his football career. He was no longer useful to anybody. <clears throat> and he was sort of like in the in the car park, sort of like, Ugh. <laughs> what now? No particular um, spiritual education or life skills education, but he was a great footballer. <laughs> yes. And I, I know it was very difficult for him to make a transition. So he uh, naturally became interested in uh, you know, various spiritual uh, persuasions and and teachers that could perhaps be helpful to him. And he'd taken it very seriously and gone all the way into a very sincere monastic life. 
a lot of meditation and uh, sort of going within and uh, reading Vedanta philosophy, uh, which of course is beautiful. And he was nevertheless very single <laughs> and becoming more and more single, <laughs> you know, like mm-hmm. uh, and the, the glamorization of celibacy in the religious traditions all around this world from, you know, Buddhism, Hinduism, Vedanta, uh, Christianity, you know, it's been the, um, the basis of um, the philosophical assumptions of world religion is that by dropping away from relationship, from tangible conditions and going within, I mean, indeed, residing as awareness to all arising conditions, you know, the witness only, <laughs> was is the ancient Samkhya philosophy that has created the philosophies of world religion. And uh, John Patrick was deeply in that, uh, in that mode of living and no doubt had had a lot of relief from his difficult life as a footballer, uh, dropped yes. off in the car park. <laughs> he, was, he was no longer useful Mm-mm. to the, um, you know, the the money-making, and uh, he he naturally had gone there and was becoming more and more, in my observation, uh, dissociated from ordinary conditions um, and dissociated from the idea of male-female coming into a perfect union. There was, there was so much difficulty in that in our life that he decided to just drop it away. Mm-hmm. As a yoga teacher, I had to say to him, John Patrick, where is your woman? Where is your equal and opposite? And of course, uh, just to be very clear, it could be where where is your uh, man or woman, you know, same sex or opposite sex intimacy. See, from the, the, this, this understanding, and it comes right out of the 10th century uh, Ramanuja Acharya of, of the great uh, Vedanta tradition is that there must be yoga, there must be the union of opposites, including the male-female collaboration, to realize the non-dual state called Advaita, Advaita, not two. It is yoga that joins the two to become one. So this statement of God and sex is based on a profound ancient teaching, actually, that became sort of sidelined or or less dominant or hardly visible as power structure created uh, the major methods and uh, institutions uh, within uh, you know, public, and that is uh, by falling away from relationship or any need or any desire whatsoever, uh, that's how you realize God. But Ramanuja, and my, you know, my teacher of modern times, he just stated exactly the opposite by the tangible embrace of all actual conditions of life. We know the source of life. And so this is uh, a most uh, important statement in, our, in, in the great yoga tradition, is that there must be participation in the given reality through the uh, related conditions and all conditions. The biggest one, of course, is the male-female polarity. This polarity has been denied by orthodoxy all over this world that's just made an assumption by you know, going to the monastery <laughs> If you're mm-hmm. a Christ, leaving the village, leaving your mother, getting away from women, going to the monastery, go to the power structure and concentrate on God, God on high. You know, this created hierarchy in society and made a, uh, a mess of the public life because its assumption was that if you're still in the village having sex or interested in sex, if you're still in the family life, you are less than the great hero who has left the women (laughs) and Mm -hmm. 
gone to the monastery and concentrated on God, or in the Buddhist, Buddhist parlance, you know, residing as awareness. Buddhism and Vedanta are sort of the same thing. Mm. Residing as consciousness only is their statement, where um, the Christian parlance is more, I'm with God, I'm concentrated on, on God, I'm, I'm, I'm ascending. <laughs> yes. My attention is that which is high, you know, and this, this idea has created the synchronistic idea of low. And what, what we had in Europe was womenless men, and in Asia too, womenless men, basically telling the public how to live their lives and what a mess. It is a you, complete mess, Mark. I mean, and, and John, just thinking about John Patrick's name for a minute too, he's 99% Irish, you know, and at that time I think he's trying to follow in the footsteps of St. Patrick. And, huh. and, you know, and, he's, and I think and what he, what he talks about actually is that he's, he's finding himself really missing intimacy. He's missing, yeah. you know, he's, he, he's up on a mountaintop and, and he just wants an embrace, you know. Yes, well, look, I, I do think this is why I put the book out, God and Sex, Now We Get Both. It's an ongoing process for any individual and definitely for the public. You know, we've only just gotten started in this mm. uh, review of, you know, is it valid, the whole idea of mm. residing as awareness or going to the monastery away from relatedness. Mm -hmm. And this is why I said to John Patrick, where is your woman? And he's so wonderful because that night he rang you and I think you had a date <laughs> the next day or something yes, like that. Yes, we did. <laughs> it was so beautiful. <laughs> and here you are together, you know, and you're living this rich family life in Mother Nature. Um, we are, However, we the, are. And you have, and you yeah. really influenced that. I have to, I have to say, I, we did actually meet soul gazing i believe it was the next day on a mountaintop yeah. and um and we and i had been with amachi so i had been doing sort of the nun scenario right for right a year or so and yeah i mean it, yeah. you know and we talked to you and we were well hang on a second you know if we if we really want to evolve what would happen if we did that together? Maybe we'd wake up more quickly. Maybe relationship actually will, will burn the fire of the ego up yeah. and will actually reside in some sort of love. And 16 years later, Mark, I would say that's true. You know, it's really yeah. been an incredibly powerful path together. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful to hear. See, the, the, the teachings in yoga that were always there in the Veda thousands of years back and then... Um, codified between the 8th and the 13th century in the, in the great body of literature called the Tantras. It, may, it was making a very clear statement that by the intimacy with your experience, you know yourself. By merging with your object of attention, <laughs> and the greatest object, of course, is your opposite intimate other, in the male-female collaboration, whether it's same-sex or opposite-sex intimacy, that union reveals the power of the cosmos because it is the power of the cosmos, you know. Mm -hmm. So by, by merging with my experience, I know the knower, I know consciousness itself. Whereas the predominant religious point of view is by going to the monastery and going within and away from desire, away from relatedness, I know sort of the basis of life, then I know consciousness. Mm -hmm. So the, this has been, this was immediately corrected, I feel, in John Patrick's life. And that yoga and his relationship with you is indeed the very means by which he knows the absolute condition of reality. That's how we know God, not by being in conflict with our experience, but by embracing our experience, and I mean really all tangible conditions, the body, the breath, the sex, <laughs> you know, body, breath, and relationship in that order uh, is, is the means of uh, actualizing the beautiful ideals that are expressed in religious tradition. And I, I quickly want to say, I mean, no disrespect to those religious traditions or anybody who has the faith with, you know, I've just been in Ireland and to see that going into a, um, 
a Christmas, Christmas carol service in the uh, Belfast Cathedral and seeing these dear people, you know, little ladies with bonnets and stooped shoulders singing, you know, you can feel their heart, you know, the love of their uh, Christian liturgy and their, that, that culture. So, I mean, no disrespect for anyone who's still feeling their faithfulness within religious tradition, be it Christianity or Buddhism. But the pre-doctrinal, you know, statements <laughs> about this is that we need a yoga to actualize uh, the beautiful ideals that are in culture. And we need male-female collaboration that actualize the beautiful ideals in culture. Mark, when you were, we're yeah, sorry to ahead. interrupt you, but I just have a question. When you were in Ireland, did you, did you run across the goddess of sovereignty or some of the more ancient traditions where the, where the feminine is actually in, included? I was very happy to walk on the uh, hill of Tara. And there's a, mm. there's a, a, a poem I love from Robin Williamson. And he says, and standing stones still remain to testify uh, from India to Ireland, from China to the Americas, standing stones testify at the time when there was goodwill, colloquy, and conversations on this world. <laughs> wow. I love That's it. It's beautiful. Yeah. I love it. I love it. I love it. And there are standing stones from India to Ireland, yeah. from China to the Americas. And there it was on the hill of Tara, where 147 uh, ancient kings had gone to marry Queen Maeve, and Queen Maeve is the the one who moves all, the, the mother of all of life, you know, the power of the cosmos, it is all life. And he had to um, be in union with her to be a king. And, of course, this sovereignty implies, is implicates everybody. Everybody is the king of their own life. Everybody is the wonder of life. Everybody is the cosmos. And it is simply a simple matter of this is how God is working. This is, this is our natural state. We do come from perfect union of male-female. It is our substance. It is our life. And by entering into the related condition with somebody else, we know that wonder, that beauty, that intelligence, that power that is so intelligent it produces new life. Now, I'm not saying everybody has to have a baby necessarily, but that's how powerful it is and how beautiful it is. And anyway, I love John Patrick for making that gesture in life. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm so glad we were able to, to wake up to the... And, and understand. I mean, I had been to Ireland quite a few times too, and it, it started to to find the fairy grail and, and find some of these stories where the, the king and the queen were living and dancing together in harmony. So I was very interested in this. But well, I needed I, to find a king, of course. You know, of course, in our honeymoon, you, we, we went to the boy. Hill of Tara. <clears throat> we did actually go to the Hill of Tara, and he put his hand on the, on the Stone of Destiny. But. Yeah, boy. <laughs> See, I think, I think there's something in that, you know. I think you're Queen Maeve, and I think <laughs> that John Patrick is, is one of the pre-Roman kings. <laughs> you know, the, the one thing that we can definitely say is that you are the power of the cosmos. You actually are, and so is everybody. And that is not an abstract statement. It's not a, some sort of spiritual statement to provoke you into trying to realise it. You don't have to realise it because you are it. You know, we're yeah, given think... these beautiful lives and we're given the male-female uh, polarity principle as the power of life that, regenerates, that is the nurturing power of life. I mean, it creates mother and father. Mm. It, it creates the nurturing that is life itself, and we are there. So, so Mark, I absolutely agree with you, but I have to say the first time I went to Ireland when I was in my 20s and I, I was walking around, I was in a horror, I was in terrible suffering. I was ex really experiencing suffering. And, and mm. I was standing there saying, my goodness, you know, here I am. It, and Eden, you know, <laughs> Ireland's pretty close if you look at the, the beautiful green, and yet there's so much suffering in, the, in that place. And um, what would you say? I mean, if we're ego-identified, maybe that's the cause of suffering, 
but of course there, there are certain moments or there are moments where we have awakenings where suddenly we break free and we realize, oh my goodness, yes, we are part, we are love, we are um, yes. everything. We, we have those liberated moments. So can, can you talk about that? Like how, if you, if you're somebody who's suffering, because, you know, imagine a lot of the planet right now is still, they're still in that place where it's difficult. Yeah, the, 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 mm. the thought structures and the emotional um, momentum of in the human life has been created mm. by the idea of the perfect person and the priesthood of the perfect person and everybody is not yet perfect. And everybody's in this arbitrary struggle to try to, you know, self-improvement programs mm. of, of every, whether it's spirituality or just secular, you know, career and, and, and uh, you know, being a consumer of, you know, of, of what the middle class massage offers the, you know, the ordinary life. Mm. And we're, we're all in that, you know. And so what I find works is that I get every, all my friends and, you know, everybody who comes to me, they're definitely just that they've come, you know, they're my friend because they give me the privilege of coming to learn, learn yoga, you know. Um, I just say again and again, and I really mean it with affection, I say to each person, oh, you're the power of the cosmos. <laughs> what could what is creating your body? Who could create your skin? What is beating your heart? What is moving your breath? What is moving your sex? What is growing your hair and allowing your perceivers to perceive? You know? mm. What's allowing you even to have a mind that can think? Like how amazing <laughs> you are that. And here's your yoga breath, the merge of the exhale and the inhale, the exhale being the strength of life that's that's your king. You know, the inhale, the receptivity of life, that's your queen, that's your queen mave of ancient Ireland. <laughs> it is it is the and we don't necessarily have to give it cultural or poetic identification like that, just that like all of life is strength that is utterly receptive. That is our natural state. We are all that. You know, all of life. A flower is the exchange of sexual chemistries, the exchange of opposites, you know. Mm -hmm. A tree has a strong ascending trunk and then the foliage is so soft and utterly receptive. <laughs> it is descending and the foliage is uh, receiving nutrients and the, uh, and the trunk is holding that foliage. Without the trunk, there could be no foliage. Without the foliage, the trunk would wither. And we are that arrangement. All of life is that. Every atom is that actually, the union of opposites. So th this has been taken off humanity by the model of the perfect person, and you're not perfect. And then that, in that model, we've controlled the public and we've taken the life away and we've taken sexuality away. And, you know, in this chain of being that is God, the the royalty, the aristocracy, the professionals and the money class and the working class, and then then the animals, you know. And in that chain of being, uh, the male is superior to the female and so on and so forth, you know. And uh, white is superior to black and brown, you know, in this European chain of being that w was until about, you know, maybe a generation or two ago was just automatic no one no one even thought that there was another uh, framework <laughs> for seeing this world you know it's, it's just it's so difficult i mean and, and one of the things that that i've really thought about reading your book too two two things actually one i loved when you spoke about the a tree it, it was a similar mm. passage and you were talking about um, observing a tree and then when we look at a tree um, you might really enjoy this young sapling, and then mm. and then you might see the tree grow, or you might see it at a different phase. And the trees, it's mature and it's complex. It's got more leaves, and it's and it's still beautiful. It's still yeah, got a presence. And then you see a really ancient tree, you know, yeah. an elder tree. I really love that that it's right. complex and it's gnarled. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, yeah. How incredibly.
complex being. And then you, you sort of talk about Yeah, I just lost you there for a moment, Anne. I'm sorry. Did you, did you lose me? I, I, well, I'm still talking away here. But I was telling my, my mother about it last night over dinner about this, this idea of the tree, this ancient, gnarled, and complex tree. Yeah. And, and she was so touched by it. Her eyes right. kind of welled up, and she goes, I am a living success story. It's true, you know. Yeah, and the, 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 the beauty is ageless from the, the time of procreation to birth through the whole of life to the ending of life uh, All of is it. the beauty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, unfortunately, ageism is the only sort of respectful prejudice that is, is sort of there in the world, you know. We, we we socially um, dis you know we we hate any kind of um, you know racism and you know all all homophobia and all the you know dreadful prejudices of the world. But this ageism is still sort of you know it's not something that we've addressed. Yes, and we and we need we need to address it. And the other thing that I think needs to be addressed not not only. Um, is, you know, we have a lot of trouble with religions because, because we've, we've separated sex out and then people act out in bizarre and uncomfortable ways, which is just a, a sign of, of the pain and suffering that goes on. But also, why, why can't women be priests? You know, why, where, are this, where are the female leaders now? What's going yeah, the, on with and, that? And, and the invention of, of male doctrine, you know, the the male fantasy of enlightenment or the male fantasy of God realization, uh, where that imagined perfect person is in some sort of superior state and everybody else is not. That arrangement, uh, usually a male power holder in history, a dominant male, and the assumption of the chain of being where male is superior to the feminine, that that has been uh, taught by uh, orthodoxy of every kind in this world has turned that assumption into the normative behaviors of our ordinary society. You know, the male knower becomes the just in the household life. You know, that it's a spell that's been put upon humanity, and you, we're well aware of the tyranny of you know, sexual aberration in, in our ordinary society, you know, all over this world. The oh, vulgarity of it, the denial of, it, the, the yeah. denial of the feminine. And, you know, it's a bad deal for the male too, you know, because they lose out on the power of the feminine. They lose out on intimacy with the feminine. You know, it's not good enough to own and control a woman. <laughs> it's boring. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and, and and sex in that usual arrangement is also worse than boring. It's painful. Yes. You know, the male stress release in, in the feminine and the whole of, you know, the ordinary sort of normative behaviours of our society with sex is like that. You know, the male stress release emptying uh, and uh, penetrating and... Uh, usually painful. Uh, there's most of the world has sort of given up. You know, like in Germany, they th- they threw out the popes and threw out the the church really. And then the Germans, in a very adolescent way, went you know had all their uh, exaggerated sex, and that got boring and painful too. So that they threw out God and they've thrown out sex as well. Now they don't have either. Yeah, <laughs> that's an, that's another problem, I suppose. Yeah, well, you, you do talk about science also, and and um, the reductionist, materialistic view, and how empty that is. So, so it's it's tricky. It's a tricky yeah, to I, find that that in breath well, and out breath. <laughs> yeah, I, I am saying that this the ancient pre doctrinal yogas of participation that were there, which was actually uh, how uh, religious experience came into the human condition. It was yoga yoga experience, the experience of being at one with reality itself. Mm. Uh, being in the in your natural state was 
was uh, yoga. And then that experience got, then uh, the utterance of yogis got turned into the written word and it turned into doctrine. And then a controlling mechanism on the public without the yoga that was required to actualize the beautiful um, experience that the yogis could and yoginis could report. So, and so it, there's a lot of neo tantra now. Um, how does that? Well, I, I say it's just uh, it's a naivety. It's another form of patriarchy. Actually, it's usually you know young men. Uh, teaching polyamory, the idea of, you know, not going beyond attachment. Uh, and it causes a lot of pain in the community, especially for women. And it's also based on the misogynist uh, uh, Hindu ideas of ascent, just like the Christians have ascent, well, so do the Hindus, where you sublimate the yoga chakras, uh, in the base of the body and you ascend to the higher chakras in the crown and sex is used as that, you know, you sort of use somebody to ascend into a higher place, a higher consciousness. And it's part of the abuse system of religion, that whole um, yoga ideal. And, it, you know, it's uh, sadly in Tibetan Buddhism and within Hinduism, that's uh, a common assumption and that's gone into the West and, uh, you know, clever young men adopt the ideas and become, uh, call themselves uh, gurus or, you know, masters of, of tantric sex. Uh, it's a nonsense, you know. T tantric sex mongers, it's another form of uh, pornography, actually. You know. mm. And it's uh, damaging. You know, yes. we, we have to learn the actual yogas, the, the union of strength that is utterly receptive in our own embodiment. And that's the mother's milk of this uh, male-female collaboration of the possibility of renewing, refreshing, and having a real and honest um, sexual intimacy uh, with somebody. It's, this is a requirement. And I want to make sure that people in the world uh, and your present listeners here actually get the opportunity because it's really easy. Anybody can do it. Unfortunately, that yoga has been popularized as another sort of form of uh, assertive misogynist activity where you have the male Noah who tells the whole world, you know, how to do the thing, you know. <laughs> and it's been popularized as mediocre gymnastics. And that appeals to a certain, you know, obsessive demographic. But what has happened is that the the actual uh, public are not getting the, the yoga tantra as it came through from the ancient world. Is and there a, the, a, a practice or something you could share with us, a short one, maybe a few minutes long, that we could we could follow along? So we maybe we'd find, if we, if we like it, maybe we'd, we'd want to join your course later. Awesome. <laughs> I have a, I, you know, I don't want to sell anybody any course or app or anything, but I, you know, I don't want to be doing that, but I do want to give yoga uh, adapted to the individual according to their needs and see that, you know, the world gets this because it is the practical means of, as I said, actualizing the beautiful ideals uh, of culture and of religion. And it always was and it always will be. And that is simply to be intimate with your own tangible experience. You know, you're the real condition of life, what well, life as it is. <laughs> so um, I really, you know, thank you for the opportunity to, to pass it on. And essentially this matter is the exhale is strength from the base of the body and it's an ascending movement. The abdominals uh, basically flatten in a little bit and push the diaphragm up. It's the exhale, strength, male. And the inhale is the upper chest expanding and receiving the inhale from above, and that is the descent in life. So 
this obviously has uh, implications to one's spiritual life because we ascend and we descend synchronistically. And there's no valid ascent without the descent. <laughs> so it's most fundamental to improving your intimacy with life of every kind, including your intimacy with somebody else that may have a sexual uh, aspect to that love, that love embrace. So I'll just do that now. I'm doing it right now as I sit here with you. My, I inhale and my arms come up over my head, and my hands meet together, and I keep my shoulders soft and dropped and the wrists soft and the elbows soft. I inhale and then I exhale and I bring the arms down like hands in a circle around my body. Inhale, I bring my arms up. And you might hear my breath, you hear my exhale. <sighs> It's a sound in the throat. And inhale, same sound. Pause and exhale. Pause. Now what's happening here is that the body movement is exactly synchronistic with the breath movement. The one and the same. The body movement is the breath movement. The inhales is from above through the whole body and the exhale is from below, the strength of my base ascending. Inhale, descending. Pause, exhale, ascending. And there's a sound that the, the larynx becomes the controlling center, not the nostrils, not a sort of muscular uh, struggle to get it, not a sniffing of life. Like It's not like that, but it's... And sometimes we call it ocean breath, where the throat is the controlling centre, not the nostril. And uh, or the actual Sanskrit name is ujjayi, or victory breath. And victory in life, the victory of the union of the male-female collaboration in life. So that's that. We'll do another couple of breaths. Inhale, my chest expands as the arms come up in a synchronistic movement in the inhale and exhale, arms come down and the abdominals flatten in and up. And this is the breath that we use, that the body uses in sleep. If you've ever heard somebody sleeping, the, the whole body starts participating in the breath as a gentle, soft sound. It's not like a valve that's controlling how much air is coming through. It's actually the, the whole body that is doing the breath. But there's this little soft sound in the larynx as the air passes to and from the body. And the whole body participates in the breath. So all the, the pranas, the nurturing force of life comes in the body and you wake up refreshed. So it's using that principle in, in, our, in the waking state. So these thanks for letting me say that and I, I just emphasize that you know nowadays with our internet you know anybody can look into this anybody can do it from a teacher's a scholarly statement there is a right yoga for every person no matter who the person is that is your direct embrace of reality or god there's reality the power of life itself, the power of the cosmos that is arising is pure intelligence, unspeakable beauty. The body in perfect harmony with the cosmos and dependence on the cosmos. That's the fact of our life. That, that's what we've been given. And anybody can do this yoga of the embrace, the enjoyment of that fact. Not a spiritual struggle trying to get somewhere or realize something in the future. Not a future enlightenment, not a future God realization, but participation in God that has brought this body into existence and is presently sustaining this body and all of life. <laughs> so with our internet these days, we can look into this. We can look at an act, uh, my act, I promise and the yoga promise, or we can buy an online course and get quite specific, detailed instruction in, 
in uh, in relationship uh, to the whole matter. And the, this online course that we've got is very nice because it's interactive where people can ask questions and the gathering around the world do it together. And uh, it's sort of like a, I think it's the next best thing to actually uh, meeting your teacher. We try to make it real and personal like that. So I, I want to make sure that this conversation and my book, God and Sex, uh, is uh, has a practical outcome. You know, there's something tangible that you can do uh, to respond. If, you're, if your heart is woken up to the fact that God is arising as all creation, you know, that the beauty of a flower or, or, or sunlight on the water is the beauty of God arising as the seen reality, as the ordinary existence, you know. If you're woken up to that fact, but nevertheless, because of the social patterning of the society we've been born into, we seem restricted from that. Uh, one man in Ireland, he's a beautiful man, he said, I hear what you're saying. I hear it. I understand it. And then he's a man in his 50s. And then he said, but why do I feel so broken? You know, oh. my heart, oh. you know, my heart, you know, the people in the churches and the pubs and, you know, the, um, St. Patrick took the, separated the, women and men, you know, you're supposed to concentrate on the priesthood and, you know, concentrate on what's high, not, not, not the ordinary intimate life, you know. So that's the, the mess that they left, us. you know, the power of Rome was controlling the European empire. And so along came St. Patrick, and I'm sure he was a good hearted fellow, but deeply ingrained in these assumptions, you know. Absolutely. Well, he was actually a slave, wasn't he? St. Patrick, I believe he was a, a Welsh, a Welshman who was stolen and was a slave who had a, some sort of Satori experience. And, yeah, um, and I, I wanted, <laughs> you know, like everybody is sincere, you know, there's no sort of um, pointing fingers at anybody, like, because uh, everybody's doing their best with the information that they have at hand, you know. Absolutely. And he probably did carry an enormous amount of light during during a very mm -hmm. dark, dark period of time. I Actually, I've heard because of St. Patrick that Ireland never went, uh, had 300 years of a golden age while the rest of Europe was in an age of darkness. So, yeah. we don't know. <laughs> well, I, ha I had an Italian woman uh, in my classes and she, I'm going to go and make an appointment with the Pope and I'm going to explain <laughs> to the Pope that God is realized in the perfect collaboration of mm. men and women, and that that women must, of course, uh, be priests in the Roman Catholic Church if they choose to. And of course, uh, men and women uh, may marry <laughs> if they choose to, and being given the wisdom of yeah, male-female collaboration and sexual practice as the very God-realizing practice. Maybe she it will said, happen. Maybe it will happen in our lifetime. A, yeah. <laughs> she should, maybe she could become Pope. It would be great. <laughs> yeah, well, I said, well, when the Pope has a, a wife of equal equal status mm. and equal social visibility and each equal teaching function, mm. uh, then we'll create a culture that will survivable culture. Yes. You heard Barack Obama say if the, all the leaders were the were women in this world, we we would fix up the planet and we'd do oh. it. I, that's a really important point. I, we're, we're starting to run out of time, but I do think maybe it would be good to say something about the ecological crisis and how maybe yeah. we can work towards a new, a new understanding of the earth. Well, I see the sharing of the practical wisdom of yoga around the world to all ordinary people everywhere, you know, uh, mm. is the essential matter on, on how we are going to start cooperating with the ecologies of Mother Nature mm. and our own intrinsic uh, harmonies and powerful 
dependence on all aspects of this cosmos. See, what well, I say that yoga is the first act of ecology, actually, because your body is the wild of Mother Nature. You are Mother Nature. When, when you look at nature, you are the beauty of nature looking at the beauty of nature. It is just one fluidity, this body and the Mother Earth that we're on. And this, is, this is what will change the assumptions that the God idea and the science left without any <clears throat> uh, participatory aspect in the ecologies has done to us. You know, science looks at from a neutral position as a observer only, not a participant, and it's created the thought structures where we are not participating in our own reality with the God and science idea. So I see that this yoga that we're putting in, thank you for helping me put it into the world, each person's actual, natural, non-obsessive, daily participation in the wild of Mother Nature and our breath, our sex, the power of this cosmos that is our own uh, reality. And this will change the thought structures that are preventing humanity urgently fixing up the matter, you know. So what this is, this is a, I heard one great scientist say, look, us scientists, we could fix this planet, the ecologies, um, because we have the know-how to do it. Unfortunately, the, the problems of humanity are not in the sciences, they're in the uh, emotion, the fear and the greed, and the desperate holding on to resources and the overproduction. The mm. inability to do anything about this is because of uh, really it's a spiritual matter or an emotional matter, you know, mm -hmm. of the society how it's functioning. So um, he was basically saying, "Hey, we need we need you in the mix." And, and <laughs> that is my view. We, you know, all the listeners, you know, and all the people who influence others. What we need is the practical means for each person to embrace the wonder of our own reality that some people call God. The yeah. creator and the creation are one. The source and the scene are one reality. Therefore, the scene is full and sufficient. The scene, the ordinary conditions are God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the ordinary mm -hmm. conditions is the appearance of, uh, of God, of form, or goddess. God and goddess are one <laughs> Reality, male, female, are the tangible conditions of all ordinary people, <laughs> all creatures, oh. all plants. That's a fact. And we need not the search to try to realize that because it's already happening. What we need is the practical means to participate in our own reality and throw out of our thought structures the idea that we're separate or the idea that we have to get enlightened or we have to get to God or something and the arbitrary imposition of the, the knower who's telling you how to live your life. And it's got to be thrown out and, and nobody is second to anybody or anyone and nobody is superior to anybody or anyone. So that assumption has got to be thrown out of the system and sometimes it's a little hard to get <laughs> but. <laughs> But when the yogas of participation are there, then it happens automatically. And that's why I urge um, folk to make it practical and learn an actual and easy yoga and do it non-obsessively on a daily basis and, and make it your principal practice, not, not meditation. Uh, Krishnamacharya in his scholarship says meditation arises as a gift of your yoga practice and he was saying that meditation should never have been taught as a doctrinal idea in buddhism uh, uh, dissociated from its context it's it, which was yoga yoga wow. the intimacy the intimacy with all ordinary conditions that's, intimacy a, powerful, with the that's a powerful yeah. thought right there mark we could I do a whole show just on that it we was, will <laughs> that would be great i would love for you to come back on and and, and help you. us understand how we can place our feet on the soil and and breathe in and breathe out, leave our brokenness yeah. behind and and participate in, in this loving, incredible, blossoming reality. 
My heart is so full. My heart is so full hearing your words Thank and you. your wisdom, everything that you've shared. And I'm excited. I, I want to join your course and I want to just keep being your friend. And, and uh, um, <laughs> well, that's, that's, uh, that's lifelong eternal. I uh-huh. think there's a heart recognition, the recognition of the one reality in which everything is happening. <laughs> you know? Absolutely, yes. In the, in the Veda that was the bed of yoga for thousands of years, is the understanding was there that the, the deity and the guru and God and your spouse and your body and the whole you know, elemental world of the body were all arising in the one reality. Mm. Some would say in God, and of course it is, and that yoga was the practical thing that you did uh, to participate in that one reality. To, In other words, it was response to the fact that you'd been inspired mm. or in response to your guru or your deity you know, what, or your mountain or your river. Mm. And I love being an island because it's like New Zealand that has this indigenous culture that's bubbling away there, the Maori of New Zealand are with us. Uh, and it seems to me to be uh, just a native understanding of all cultures everywhere prior to the invention of doctrine that created modern civilization. And that is that we are all in one reality. Yes. And there's a simple thing that you can do uh, called yoga, which is how you participate in this one reality. That it must be learned and it's easily shared. And uh, I look forward to people having a look at it, you know, via their smartphones or their whatever and see the practice, how you actually do it. And then yeah. have a go at doing it for 40 days. <laughs> 40 days, 10 minutes a day, that's all. And see the difference that it makes to your life to your feeling of well-being and the difference it makes to intimate relationship and sexuality. Oh, my goodness. This could be the revolution right here. <laughs> yeah, I reckon. <laughs> it could That's be. That's the way well. I see it. <laughs> yeah. um, most, we can breathe together, hold, Thank hold you. hands, and we can, we can uh, and, yes, move into the heart of wisdom with you. So yeah. that's just incredible. So thank you so much and to be continued, I hope. And um, thank you you, to everyone. Yes, thank you so much, Mark. So, and thank you to everyone else who's who's joined in as well. And um, you can find Mark. Where do we find you again? Heartofyoga.com. Excellent. Okay. I'll be there waving at you. (laughs) Excellent. Excellent. In the meantime, inhale, arms come above the head. Pause. Exhale, arms down. Ah. Six breaths, rest. <laughs> I've got it. Yes, I feel it right now. This practice has made me full for the day. It's incredible. Yeah, it's very easy to do. Anybody can do it. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. All right. And uh, to be continued, you've been listening to Ann Kate Sullivan, host of Wisdom of the Ages. If you want to view my books, which are actually about Celtic mythology, so if you want to, to find out more about that, that sort of yoga, <laughs> you can go on to ankatesullivan.com. So until we meet again, may the wisdom yeah. of the ages reveal its secrets to you one message at a time. Thank you so much, Mark. Well, love you so much, and Love all those people out there. Thank you. Hey, love, Bye-bye. love, yes, love, love. <laughs> yeah, one love. See ya. One, one love. See you later. Are you ready to discover your superpowers? Go now to superpowerexperts.com and take the superpower quiz today.